Hello, welcome everybody to the American Academy of Attorney CPA Study Group webinar titled How I'm Changing My Practice, Client Meetings, Client Planning, and More to Address the Coronavirus. My name is Kimmy Hedlund and I'm with the AAA CPA National Office and will be moderating this presentation today. We are pleased to have with us today Mr. Marty Shankman and Mr. Jonathan Blattmarker to present on this critical issue. If you would like to chat with fellow attendees during the program, I placed a Padlet URL link in the GoToWebinar control panel. Additionally, you can find the handouts for this program in the control panel area. And it is my pleasure. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Marty and Jonathan to begin the presentation. Thank you, Kimmy. Uh, and thank you, Jonathan, for joining me. Um, um, I've been a member of the AAA CPA for many, many years, and uh, I'm pleased and happy to help. This is a very, very difficult time for all of us, and uh, Jonathan and I both help, hope that uh, through this program we'll give you uh, some thoughts and ideas uh, so that you, you, you will have some, something practical to do to help you in, in getting through the, the, the coming month for sure, and I hear uh, far more than the coming month. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to say anything before we, we, we get going, just uh, in general, to introduce the topic? Well, thank you, Marty. I do welcome everyone, and thank you for giving us an opportunity to present this. I've been in practice for about 50 years, and I've never seen anything quite like we have right now. Uh, I was there during a number of bear markets, including the terrible markets in the 1970s, the terrible market that we had in 19 in the late 1980s and one of the things that i learned at that time is that even though property values dropped and it was an ideal time to do estate tax planning in the sense that you had property which was worth much much less because of the tremendous drop off in the stock market overnight in 1987 clients felt financially vulnerable and as a consequence, it was almost impossible for them to agree to do any sort of significant estate tax planning. And I think that is where we are now, except as Marty and I will explain, unlike back in the 1980s, there are now ways in which the client can remove assets from his or her estate and yet continue to benefit and actually to continue to control the destiny of that property up until the time they die. Uh, these are relatively new ideas we'll get into. Uh, like everything, they don't appear instantly, but they grow over time. But I think we're in an ideal time where you can go to clients and say, look, you can do estate planning with very, very little, if any, risk of gift and estate and income tax as a consequence. Get the assets out of your estate and yet be able to enjoy them for the rest of your life if you need to. So we're going to get into that, and I think that that may be a way to interest people to do it. But to begin, I think Marty is going to talk about some more fundamental things about practice, and then even fundamental things that clients of all types, whether they're super rich, as Marty still is, or whether they're poor, as I am, really need to consider. So thank you, Jonathan. So let's start with some practice um, issues and considerations. Um, I'm going to try to go through this a bit quickly from the standpoint that I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about some of the planning opportunities that we should be talking about uh, with our clients. Um, we're not going to talk about the CARES Act that was just passed. Uh, I'm still in the process of digesting it, as perhaps many of you are. And it's just like we were saying, it's a wild time. And we, we had the SECURE Act at the end of last year. Um, we had this horrific coronavirus that is ongoing. The impact keeps changing uh, and, frankly, sadly, getting worse. Uh, many, if not all of us, are working remotely. I've been working remotely for nearly three weeks, and um, uh, it's going to go on for at least another month, maybe longer. So it's having a huge impact on practice. Um, the economic situation, you know, the market is, is up, it's down, but it, it's probably down overall. Jonathan, 25% from the height still, even with the, the run-up that it's had of late. So clients well, are, as Jonathan said, go on. It, dep it depends on the market you look at. The S&P 500 is down about 18% today. 
And personally, I'm surprised that it's rebounded so much. But there are, I think, two reasons, and perhaps our audience would be interested in those, at least I believe. Number one, a huge amount of trading, in fact, it may be the majority of trading today, isn't done by a human being making a decision. It's done by an algorithm. There is a formula. And in fact, one of the reasons we had such devastating drops in the market back in 2008, 2009, was that these things were set on autopilot without any human being looking over it. And when the market would plunge and people would begin to sell, then someone else's algorithm would say it's time to sell, and that would trigger someone else's algorithm to, to go ahead and sell. The second reason is that you have to have rebalancing of certain accounts. A pension plan, for example, it's decided it's going to be 50% in securities and 50% in bonds. Well, as the stocks begin to drop, that means you have to rebalance. And the rebalancing usually occurs at the end of a quarter, and we're just about there. And I think that because the stocks have dropped so much that that's why they're now getting ready, and you're seeing it by increase in you know, five of the past six days uh, to go up in the market. I personally think that those won't last. I, I, I could be wrong. I can't foresee the future better than anybody else can. But I think that those may be the reasons. It wasn't just that everybody decided, oh, it's not as bad as it seems to be. The Federal Reserve Bank, I think of St. Louis today, said that they thought that unemployment could reach 34% in the United States, which is higher than it ever reached in the Great Depression. Now, we all hope it's going to be temporary, that we can get through this thing very quickly, that people can go back to work and the economy will rebound. But there are going to be many, many people who are greatly hurt by this. So, Marty, that's where the market is. Uh, I personally think it has um, a little bit further to, to go before we reach the low point. I hope I'm wrong. So one of the things we all have to deal with are client communications. Um, there's some material and sample emails and things. I'll point out just one or two as we go through. Um, many of you may have already from your practices sent out email blasts to clients and contacts. Um, the, the kind of common ones I'm seeing is, hey, we're here, we care, we know it's a tough time, stay safe and, and we're reachable, uh, you know, using our cell phones and here are those numbers or we're reachable, call the switchboard, it'll transfer you, uh, whatever. Um, I, I've chosen not to send out any kind of email like that. I just don't really think it's all that relevant. Um, we're set up so that um, our office phones are internet web, uh, web-based web phones. So I took my office phone with me. I plugged it into my uh, home 150 miles away um, in Connecticut. And uh, my office phone rings here just fine as if I were in the office. Uh, it has its own IP address. I plugged it into my router and, and we're ready to roll. Um, if you don't have um, uh, web-based phones, internet phones, it's something you might want to look into, and you may still be able to set that up uh, with getting some help remotely. Um, I, I just didn't see the point of that, and, and I honestly, you, you all probably, like I, have been inundated with that. Um, I do think that, that a second type of, of communication is important, and that is to inform clients of some of the planning and things they can think about. Uh, Jonathan introduced the tax and, and estate planning that we're going to talk about for certainly the last half of this program. But some of the other things that many of you may deal with as, as accountants, you may want to inform people, obviously, of the, the, the uh, extensions for payment and, and, and filing. Um, but I think it's very important, and I haven't really seen a lot about this, but many of our clients, and even frankly, many of us, need to be concerned about how long this goes on and the, the economic impact. So many of our clients, even clients that are seemingly well-to-do, need to start reevaluating their expenses, tightening their belt, and, and trying to plan for um, what hopefully is longer than what it turns out to be so they're safe. And that's certainly something that we as accountants can reach out to them and help apprise them of. I've done mailings and communications to clients in several different ways. Uh, every bill that goes out of my office has an attached article. If you don't write articles, you can write a, a little memo or letter. You can certainly extract materials uh, from this PowerPoint. Um, I want clients to know that we're giving them ideas to deal with a wide range of different things. Uh, services like MailChimp, Constant Contact make it very easy to communicate um, electronically. Um, I still use some paper communication uh, just because a lot of our older clients are not 
uh, adept at dealing with email, although even many of the older clients are getting there. Um, so mailings, emails, articles with bills. Uh, on the bottom of every bill, I put a footer that discusses some of the planning that can be done. On slide seven, I have a, a, an eight, I have a little summary of some of the points that I've actually used in my client communications. Uh, feel free to take, take it and modify it if you haven't communicated with clients. Uh, I think even if clients don't respond, they appreciate getting information from us. The one thing I do know that clients like to get uh, from lawyers and accountants, the, probably the only thing is free advice. And I think in troubling times like this, they will appreciate getting some advice. And we're going to talk about uh, a number of these different points uh, that are here um, as we go through the program. Um, there's another sample email on some of these other slides. Uh, and I acknowledge the firms that sent them out. I thought they were good. I'll just leave them uh, for you to go through. I think we all need to rethink how we're operating. Uh, some of the companies, when I email them, some of our, our colleagues that I'm working on with, with different client matters, every time I email them, I get an automatic email response saying, you know, uh, we're working remotely, but somebody will get back to you. I think that's, that's kind of almost absurd, and it looks bad. I mean, everyone should be able to check their email remotely, and I'm sure even that the firms that are doing this are able to. Why do they have an automatic response on saying they're working remotely? Just Just give some thought to how what you do to respond to this um, uh, appears to your client. Uh, another point that was made to me by uh, a very bright colleague of ours, Tom Rogerson, I thought was interesting on, on slide 14. You know, it's a really tough time. Uh, people are, are, are isolating primarily at home, uh, some in family groups, but oftentimes parents are in one home. You know, I, I, the, the, the hardest part about this isolation for me is not seeing grandkids, and I'm sure other people feel this way. But what a great opportunity um, for clients to try to build and encourage family communications. And there's a webinar I did with Tom Rogers that you can, Rogerson, that you can access for free on the Shankman Law website. And the, the specific address is uh, there on slide 14. So that's another thing we can talk to about with appropriate clients to take advantage of this. Now, slide 15, and this could be a, a whole day program, and I don't want to belabor it, but I do want to try to give you some highlights of some of the things that we're doing to work remotely and a few of the things we've been kind of tinkering with and discovering along the way, because I think all of us are in that same boat of kind of discovering things along the way. Um, I, I feel kind of a, a bit in an advantage in the sense that I've been working in a significant way remotely for many, many years. So we're, we're pretty adept at it. And it wasn't really a meaningful, it wasn't a significant adjustment for me. For some of you, it may be the same. For others, it may be more of a struggle. Um, if you haven't gone paperless, this is a tough time, and this should be an incentive to finish going paperless. Um, I'm not sure you can actually complete that process now um, with so many businesses shut down, but it's certainly something to reassess. Uh, a, a, an attorney and estate planner colleague of ours I was talking to the other day, and I asked how he was doing uh, working remotely. He said, oh, it's not too bad. You know, every day or two, I have a courier go to the office and bring my red welds back and take the red welds I'm done with back to the office. That's, that's not really practical. And I hope most of you are beyond that, either cloud-based or a network you can access remotely. We have uh, most of our records uh, in net documents um, for reasons of file structure. Um, um, we keep certain files on our network because I like to preserve a file structure that just doesn't seem to work great with net documents or some of the online document management systems. And I use go to my PC uh, to access um, my, my, my desktop and it, uh, it's as if I'm sitting at the desktop. If you don't have something like that in place, it's, it's a great product. It's owned by a company, log me in uh, and you can contact them. That same company, Log Me In, owns all the go-to products, which include uh, GoToWebinar, which is the interface that uh, AAA CPA is using for this uh, webinar. Um, I've been doing a number of webinars and posting them to my website to help educate uh, and inform colleagues and clients, just like this webinar. Um, and uh, using GoToMeeting, which is another one of their products for meetings. You've all, I, I don't think you can turn on any, any news and not hear about uh, Zoom. And what it's been doing, uh, GoToMeeting has been around for a long time, and the interface is very similar to GoToWebinar, which makes it easy to work between all of them. 
Um, there's a number of other products and, and approaches that are listed on some of these pages that may be of help to some of you. Um, another thing that we've started to do, uh, and I think will take off now, and there's, there's uh, uh, developments all over the country, and I'll ask Jonathan to comment uh, in, in a second on it. Um, we have a, a product called, um, I think, Right Signature. Uh, there's a number of them where we can set up a document for somebody to sign electronically. Um, one of the issues, and we're going to talk about it uh, in depth, Jonathan, and I'll ask you to comment when we get there, is what we do about getting documents signed in this environment. Uh, and that's, that's a real challenge, and, and we'll talk about it. There's issues of security. Uh, there's been stuff all over the um, internet about uh, problems with Zoom. Um, I, I don't have the technical knowledge to really uh, get that detailed on it. Uh, go to my PC, which is, is another um, product, go to meeting, uh, claims and says they have um, uh, very substantial encryption that should prevent a problem. My understanding, and I, I spent some time talking to our consultants and uh, the people that logged me in about it, is that a staff member from my firm can use go to my PC, sign in on their laptop from home, and because they're going through the go to my PC portal, it's perfectly safe. And the policy that we have is nobody is allowed to save documents on their laptop from my staff, so there should be no uh, security issues or document loss or uh, problems resulting from that. It's important that you make policies for staff so that if they are working remotely, you don't find that at the end of, of this, and one day this will come to an end, that multiple staff members have multiple layers of documents saved on various home or laptop computers, none of which may be encrypted or have the appropriate virus protection, uh, and then uh, you have client confidentiality issues. So I would certainly look into that. And there's some more information on slide 20. Um, so here, here's another thing that I've been doing. Um, and again, I'm not selling any products. I'm just telling you what I'm doing, hopefully to be helpful. And if you Google any of the products that I've mentioned, I'm sure all the competitors will come up as well. So one of the challenges that um, uh, we all have working remotely is you don't have the contact with administrative staff. Uh, a number of the firms I've talked to have actually, and I just spoke to one recently who, who has actually let go um, more than half of their administrative staff. I was actually surprised so early on that they did that. Um, but how do you get document types? Uh, there's a product called Dragon, which uh, years ago I looked at and didn't find um, to be uh, as robust as they, they promoted, and now it's actually quite incredible. Um, on one of the webinars I did with Jonathan, I think last week, I actually put on my Dragon software and just dictated live while we were doing the webinar. Uh, I didn't set up to do that, and I don't want to waste your time with it now, but it actually will type as fast as I'm talking and pretty accurately. The other thing that I've done is if I mark up a document or I want something proofread, because there's always transcription errors in something like um, uh, uh, Dragon, uh, we outsource. We can email products, and, and the company I use is uh, listed in the bottom of slide 22. Again, I'm not favoring anyone. I'm just trying to give you some practical ideas. We can email them documents and get them back uh, the same day or, or email them at the end of the business day here and because of their seven hour eight hour time difference uh, we'll get them back the next morning when we start working again so i can dictate a whole series of memos and send it out and have somebody proofread it and clean it up i could dictate an article and have somebody turn it into a more finished version of an article another thing that you can do um, when we use go to meeting uh, and any of the, the the web products meeting products probably have it i'm not familiar if zoom has it but i suspect they do you can record the meeting with just clicking a button, no different than recording a, a webinar like this. And then what you can do is, is either in the, the product itself, have that recording transcribed, or there's uh, websites, one is called Scribby, one is called um, um, uh, uh, Temi, T-E-M-I, that for fairly insignificant cost, you can email them the file of the recording of a web meeting with a client or a webinar like this, they'll transcribe it and send it back to you. I then take those files and email them out to an outsourcing company where American expats who speak English like we do clean it up and send it back to me. So very insignificant cost. You can really uh, replicate a lot of the typing and proofreading and writing that you had staff doing. 
another thing that um, uh, we've done with clients in terms of web meetings is, and we did this several weeks ago, even before uh, businesses were told to shut down, is we had uh, a policy that we would only do web meetings, no in-person meetings, uh, unless it was necessary. And we did in-person meetings solely for a couple of will signings. And we'll talk in a few minutes how we're going to now deal with that. But um, many clients are pretty comfortable with the web conference, and it's worked quite well. And I also find it's less time intensive. We can review a, a, a trust in about half the time on a web meeting than a face-to-face -face meeting because you don't have all the social formalities and chit chat and clients are always appreciative of, of, of saving uh, money. Um, I'm assuming your clients are no different than that. So again, a web meeting is not just a web meeting, but you can offer a client that, listen, for no cost, I can record the meeting and for a very modest cost, I can have it transcribed. So if you want a memo or follow-up detailed letter about the meeting, um, I'm going to start with something for nominal cost, like $20 that will get me started on a memo and save an hour of my time. Clients will appreciate that. And that's a great way to help motivate clients to get into doing something new. And I'm sorry, here's uh, Scribby is one of the transcription services that, that we use. Another thing that we found is, is when it, we're meeting with clients for the first time by, by a web conference as opposed to in person, how do they get documents to us? A lot of clients that in the past would be able to scan something and send it to us don't have the equipment at home. First of all, all of us, and certainly all clients working from home, and even all your staff, you can buy a pretty robust all-in-one scanner printer copier for 100 bucks and have it delivered to your door from uh, Staples, Amazon, or any place uh, that's pretty good. One of the things that we've suggested to clients, you can also get free a free app, and there's a number of them. DigiSet on slide 27 is one that we've used. You can take a picture with your smartphone, it converts it to a PDF. I think you can even sign the document um, on that uh, DigiSet app for free and email it uh, back. So if you want a client to sign an engagement letter, uh, that's something you can do. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that I think is very important, and I, I may come to it again in a second. Slide 30, finance. How are you going to get mail? How are you going to get bank deposit? It's getting harder to do all that. If you haven't taken if you have not taken credit cards in the past, do so. You can process a credit card remotely. A client can give you the card number. You can get a payment. It goes direct into your account, which in this very trying time that we're in, and it, again, if it goes on for a month, it's going to get harder and harder, uh, much easier to get a credit card payment. So that's something you may want to think about. Slide 31, this is something that we just started doing a couple weeks ago. In my office, we do a lot of, we've all for years done a lot of stuff electronically but if i wrote a letter to a client we would print the letter in hard copy i would sign it on letterhead we'd scan it and email it to the client and for many clients especially older ones we would typically follow the email up with a hard copy by regular mail so that's just really hard to do working remotely not having staff printing at home i, I just didn't feel it was practical and it had been way too time consuming so we scanned a piece of our letterhead and converted it to a Word document, and we typed that into a template. And on that template letter, I added, we're still working remotely, stay safe. Uh, you can reach us by phone. It rings through to our cell phones. You can email us. We all have remote access to email and whatever, so that that, that kind of general explanation is now in every letter to every client. And what I've done is because the letterhead doesn't really look quite like real letterhead scan, I have the sentence in the middle of slide 31, letterhead not used as we're working remotely due to coronavirus. And instead of printing and physically signing something, I just put a slash S slash at the bottom, type my name, and I did it in script so it looked more like a signature. And then I put beneath it, not signed because of working remotely due to coronavirus. I, I think it at least it's more apologetic. It explains why we're working this way. But I got to tell you, this has added so much efficiency because I don't need the secretary to print and sign and do whatever with the letter. I just type right into this template and out it goes. Uh, I'm gonna probably keep trying to figure out a way to do this, just maybe enhance how it looks uh, when this current dilemma is over. Firm finances, I, I don't wanna lecture any of you on, you all probably are smarter at all this than I, but we all need to take a look at what's gonna happen with cash flow. Um, you know, lots of clients are hurting. A lot of clients are gonna go out of business. Uh, certainly the very wealthy clients that we're going to talk about estate planning should be able to pay for it. 
but even those clients are going to feel financially bruised or worse. And if Jonathan is right, and I hope he's wrong, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of betting, uh, or unfortunately, that I think he's right, that there's a lot more uh, downside in the market and a lot more downside in the economy to come. Um, we need to make sure that we've dealt with our uh, issues as well. Jonathan, let's, let's tackle a topic um, uh, that is really important to everybody. Um, maybe you could give a, a, just an introduction and some comments on electronic signing, and we'll save your window, window act uh, for after that. Well, as we all know, uh, wills have to be signed in accordance with the statute of wills. Uh, which is a very old law we got from England and virtually every state has adopted. And in general, you have to be in the physical presence or line of sight of both the testator and the witnesses. In some states, New York has to, happens to be one, the testator can sign it alone and then can take the will to the witnesses, declare it to be his or her last will and testament, and ask them to sign. That can be done. But normally, uh, and I've actually never done that. Every time I've had a will execution, I've had the people physically present. There's a case in New York which says an execution over the phone where the testator was on one line of the telephone and the witnesses on another. And you, we went through the recitals where the testator said, I've signed this instrument, it's my last will and testament. I'm asking you, John and Mary, to be the witnesses and they did so, the court held that that was not a valid execution and therefore it was not a valid will. Now, there have been some advances. Uh, one is with the Uniform Electronics Will Act, which a few states have signed, but is not really effective in any yet. Florida has adopted it, but I think it's July 1 where it can be signed electronically. The question is, can you have the witnesses see the person sign, say, by Skype or Zoom? Will that count? And there, there are differences in opinion. I think Marty and I tend to feel that it should be okay. But just yesterday, Marty, I don't even know if I told you this, I had to sign a new will. Um, not that I have coronavirus, but I feel very vulnerable now, as many people do. And I called our neighbors. And I said, I want you to come out on your stoop and be witnesses to my will. I went halfway up the path and I then signed the will, showed it to them and said, I declare this to be my last will and testament. They saw me sign and I'm going to put it down now. And I'm hoping you two will come forward 25 feet and sign it as attesting witnesses. And they did and they put it down and then they went back to their stoop and I got up and I took my will away. Now, again, we were in presence. It was 25 feet away at closest, but still it was in their presence. Um, that's something that really needs to be done. Uh, but you have this line of sight versus physical presence, uh, telephone communication, at least the one case that I'm aware of said it wouldn't work. Marty and I tend to feel that Skype and Zoom is much more likely to be. But if you can avoid having to rely on something like Skype or Zoom for a will execution, uh, please do so. So Marty, why don't you say something about uh, Through the Looking Glass? So Jonathan, and, and th this was Jonathan's theory, and I'm actually going to use this for a client that we need to get documents signed because uh, she's an elderly woman, very frail, and uh, in her mid-90s, and we certainly don't want to risk exposing her to anything. Um, uh, the, the family accountant is a notary and he's going to take the documents over to her leave them in an envelope and she'll open the door and pick up the envelope she's going to stand in the living room window and sign all the documents the home health aide will witness he's going to watch both of them do that and he will then when she's done they're going to put him back in the envelope and leave him on the porch he'll then go up to the porch pick them up and notarize them um, so that, that was, uh, what we kind of called at the bottom of slide 35, uh, through the looking glass. Um, let me just take a minute and, and, and comment. Jonathan and I did a, 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 a longer webinar, um, uh, last week, and we actually did a mock will signing using, uh, go to meeting, which is similar to zoom and Skype and so on. And I think that if people actually watched what we did and thought about it, um, 
they would realize that that our aversion as practitioners to remote signing is really in most cases misplaced um i had uh the cameras on so that uh, uh the audience uh watching saw me jonathan uh mitchell gans another attorney um and they were my witnesses um i showed each page of the will to the camera as, as, after i initialed it so you had a photographic uh, a, 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 a film recording if you will a, a photographic record of each page of the will so if there was ever a question what i signed each page is recorded in the in the video um this video shows me signing you could see me fully signing and you saw, saw jonathan and mitchell gans watching me sign before i started signing we went through the you know the de declaration that i read it i understood it it's my will i declared to be my last will and so on and so forth um i panned the room with the camera from the laptop so you could see there was nobody standing behind me holding a gun I showed uh, for a, a few seconds a, a view out of the window of the room I was in. So when I identified the physical location where I was, Danbury, Connecticut, my street address, you could prove that later if there's a question because you have the visual uh, view outside. The entire thing was recorded. Uh, and um, what I would have done is had Jonathan and Mitchell sign a remote notarization attesting to the fact that they watched me notarize this remotely. Uh, and then, you know, send them a copy of the will to to notarize on the same page. And I would append it to the 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 um, uh, uh, affidavits they signed while watching this go on. And so now not only would I save the recording, but I would have it transcribed. And if you want to be even extra careful, you could have counsel afterwards review the transcription and sign some kind of affidavit that that is, in fact, the transcription of the will signing that occurred. Um, I think that with those kind of recordings, transcription, videos, and everything else, in many ways, it can actually be more secure than a will signing that we do in the traditional sense. If you had to testify as to a client's will signing uh, from 10 years ago, you've probably signed, uh, uh, supervised a thousand will signings, maybe more in the last 10 years, uh, maybe much more. How are you going to testify? You're going to say that my process, my procedure in my office is to do such and such, and that's what I would have done for Mrs. Jones. Um, you know, you're really kind of going from memory. When you do this electronically, the way I've just described, you really have a, a far more um, uh, visual and accurate recording of everything. Now, I don't want to go through the different states um, because it's all changing and it's dynamic and different states are very different. Um, Jonathan, uh, you want to make some comments just about a couple of states as examples very quickly? Just to illustrate, and then we'll get into the tax planning. Yeah, uh, the states are doing two things. Kentucky has just passed a bill which allows basically remote uh, Skype or Zoom or go to meeting execution of wills. Uh, it's it's not perfectly worded, but at least they got it through, and I think the courts there will accept it. Uh, there have been a couple of other states where the governors have taken an executive order uh, that's been done in New York, for example, although it expires on April 18th. We're going to have to have things signed remotely, and it may be because your client is in a nursing home, you're not allowed in, your client is not allowed out. You might try the window way unless you carefully check the law and determine that you can do it remotely. Of course, if your client is in a nursing home and is old and frail, uh, she or he might have difficulty in doing that. Whether someone else can assist them, I don't know. You can always try, if you can get them on the phone, the window way of doing it. Marty and I are confident that that will work. Again, you'll give the document to the client by first-class mail or slipping it through the mail slot. The client will take it out of the envelope. You delivered it in. She will go or he will go to a window where she can see you and the other witness and maybe the notary and you guys can see her on the other side. Uh, I think it would be best if you could hear each other through the window, as opposed to just relying on a cell phone, but you might want the cell phone just there to make sure that you are hearing it. Now this is extreme, and one of the things I think will happen over the next many months is that states will enact laws to take care of this kind of situation, because although I knew all my adult life about the Spanish flu, I knew it was never going to happen again. 
I knew we were never going to get on this kind of lockdown. I had read uh, the, the, the book, The, the Stand, uh, uh, by Stephen King, which is something like this, although it's, it's much worse. But I knew it would never happen in the United States. I was wrong. Now I believe maybe it would happen again and that we have to have the various states pass laws which will allow us to more seamlessly cope with something that happens like this in the future. So just a couple of other quick comments to add to that, and then we're going to get to uh, the, the tax planning part, because that's really critical for all of us. Um, in New Jersey, a holographic will is valid. So I could have a client sign a couple line handwritten will that says, I'm Marty Shankman, named Jonathan Blotmacher as my executor, and I bequeath all my estate to the Marty Shankman Revocable Trust. Um, I don't need to say much more than that. This is my will and sign it. So I could do a holographic pour over will. A revocable trust, um, now I'm blanking. I think I need witnesses, but I don't think I need a notary. So it at least eliminates that. So well, maybe, Marty, he, Marty, let me, uh, Marty, let me, let me interrupt. In many, many states, uh, you don't need witnesses and you don't need a notary. Probably the most strict state is in Florida, where if your trust revocable or, or I think even irrevocable has testamentary attributes as a revocable trust would, uh, it has to be executed essentially in accordance with the statute of wills. Uh, you've got to have witnesses, you've got to have declarations. In New York, uh, and we had to do this to get the state to approve revocable trusts for historic reasons which are interesting but I won't go through them now, you couldn't do a revocable trust in New York, some lawyers felt. So they finally agreed to it, but it had to either be notarized or basically witnessed. But if I wanted to do a revocable trust today, because I, I just can't get my will done or whatever, you can have a trustee in another example, like, and there are a lot of other states like this, you don't need a notary, you do not need a witness, and you can sign them in counterpart. So what you could do, I could do this right now with my nephew who lives in Anchorage. I would have him print out a copy of the trust. And in fact, we just did this yesterday for a trust Betsy created, Marty. I won't give you the background, but I had to have Betsy create a new trust. She signed it here in Garden City on Long Island for, I signed as the trustee, one of the trustees for investment purposes. And my nephew signed in Alaska, and we did it in one ceremony, but we declared Alaska law would control. And because we have an Alaska trustee, that's going to work. Now, if I, if I didn't have a valid will, and I do, and I desperately needed one, what I could do is, in some states at least, not all, New York has limitations on this, you could do a handwritten or so-called holographic will, which can be very simple. You'd say, I, Jonathan Blotmacher, and everybody knows I'm of sound mind, so we don't have to say that. But I, Jonathan Blotmacher, hereby declare this document to be my last will and testament. I bequeath all of my assets to the revocable trust, which I signed just before now, which you can do by going to somebody in Alaska or another state that doesn't have met my eyes. And um, I waive any bond, uh, and I... Um, and I appoint, uh, you know, Marty Shankman or my nephew or whatever as executor. And if you're going to have guardians say, I appoint my sister Sarah as the guardian of any minor child of mine. So you've got maybe 50 or 60 words, which almost anyone can write out. It's pouring over. Everything you own is pouring over to that revocable trust, which you've created without the necessity of a notary. And in the vast majority of states, but there are limitations, like in New York, uh, holographic wills, unless you're, you know, in the military or a seaman at sea, you can't do a holographic will. But in most states you can, and that would kind of be a course of last resort, but it could be done if you were otherwise desperate, and the client would be able to write it out in her own hand. Um, one last thought very quickly. On slide 3940, um, uh, I discussed some case law in New Jersey. New Jersey will accept a writing intended as a will, but you may have to have, you'll have to have a proceeding to, 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 to confirm it. Um, so if you can't meet all the statutory requirements, if the writing was intended to be a will and you can demonstrate it to the court, 
it'll probably be accepted. I think the protocol that Jonathan and I discussed for a, a web-based uh, recorded will signing would certainly be admitted um, uh, in New Jersey as a writing intended as a will. And that may be something you want to look at. Now, not every state's going to have that, but if you have a hard-pressed situation where you can't do anything else and you can't comply with whatever statute or uh, 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 you know uh, actions passed by a governor um, uh, during this difficult time, you may just have no choice but to try to see if you can get something admitted as a writing intended to, as a will. So just to summarize, every state is enacting emergency legislation, it seems. They're all different. Some are more helpful than others. Some of them are so um, formulistic that I don't even know how we're going to make them work. Um, if that doesn't work and that doesn't give you an out, but you got to be very careful because, again, the rules are very different. There's tight time frames and so on. The other option is a writing intended as well. Another option is use a rev trust in a state like Alaska where you don't have statutory requirements, just name an Alaskan trustee. Another option is the holographic pour over will into a rev trust. So hopefully that'll give you some options. Check your state law. And if your state has not done something yet, they probably will because so many states are moving very carefully. Um, let's go on um, and skip through the rest of this. And um, let me make one quick comment. Um, one of the ways to get clients going is estate planning basics. Uh, if clients can't get focused on, on, on more sophisticated planning, uh, the basics, which you all are familiar with, may be a way to get your toe in the door to get them moving in the way they should. Two comments, and I'll stop on the basics. One, uh, one of the things that we've done with healthcare proxies um, and, and, and living wills is that many of these clients of ours have signed documents that they don't necessarily understand and that may have a, a, an express total prohibition against intubation. With coronavirus, the whole point of all these conversations about the shortage of ventilators is because it attacks the lungs and if you become ill enough, the only way you're going to survive is to be intubated. Many of our clients will have signed documents, maybe even unbeknownst to us, that have a complete and total prohibition against intubation. Make sure if the clients do that, you tell them they have to read it and get rid of that. Second point, in the past, slide 51, client um, uh, agents would go to the hospital, talk to the doctors, sign whatever papers and decisions will be made. And the coronavirus tragedy that we're living through, that's not going to happen. First of all, the virus is simply too contagious. Hospitals are too overrun. They're not going to have an agent call to make a decision, uh, come in to make a decision. So what I've done is I've modified the form that I use for HIPAA releases and health proxies using the language on, on, on slide 51 to expressly authorize the agent to communicate via FaceTime, Skype, whatever, email, anything like that indemnify and hold harmless the medical providers for permitting it. Um, let's skip on and jump into the tax planning. Jonathan, um, you want to explain why today may be the most ideal time, uh, even though people aren't emotionally comfortable dealing with it, to plan? Well, there, there are three important reasons, and I'm not sure we're ever going to see actors uh, converge with this potential, let's call it a perfect storm. Number one, we have huge exemptions for estate, gift, and generation skipping transfer tax purposes. We know they are slated to disappear at the stroke of midnight as 2025 goes into 2026. That's, you know, that's the law. Of course, it could be changed. But perhaps more likely, um, it's going by legislation enacted sooner. And it's not just if the Democrats get into power, and they, of course, are proposing a $3.5 million exemption for states and a million dollars for a gift, but it may be that the cost of this bailout, they're going to have to raise taxes. I mean, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said when we went into World War II, this means two things, more debt and more taxes, and more taxes and more debt. And I think that that may happen. I, I just can't imagine that we're not going to have an increase in taxes and a state tax, especially because it's aimed at the wealthier Americans, uh, may be something that it really happens. So, but even if it doesn't happen, use it now because it's eventually going to go away. Second, you now have exceptionally low values. Maybe they'll go further. But this is the time to think about giving away or selling assets at their low values now. That's kind of that some of the 
pros and cons. Also, tell you some of the estate systems that we use, like Gratz is essentially flawed. Accounts investigation will be fully a lot of things that are going to take all the trust back into you. Jo Jonathan, there your, may your, be your line is, Jonathan, yeah. your, Jonathan, your, your line is breaking up. I don't know if you can go someplace else for better reception, but you're breaking up. Not that, that Marty is better. No, no, you're still breaking up. Um, so let Not me, now. I'll, I'll, I'll go. Perfect. Go for it. Well, okay, I'll, I'll try. But in any event, I was saying that uh, there, there is, there are lower values, uh, and if your client believes that the values will recover sometime in the future, this is the time to transfer those assets by gift, using the large exemptions, or by sale. Keeping in mind that the IRS has basically said, if you have an $11 million exemption today, and it is going to go down to three and a half million, you might say, well, why don't I give away eight and a half million dollars now or eight million dollars now? That way I'll I'll have used the eight and I can preserve the three and a half that will be in effect when I die. That's not the way it works. If you want to use any part of this enhanced exemption, you have to use it before the law changes, before the law goes down. It's basically going to come out of the bottom end before it comes out of the top end. That's something. That's something else that the clients really need to consider. The final factor is the low interest rates. Many of the strategies which we use, like installment sales to grantor trusts and like GRATS, are dependent upon the IRS interest rates. For installment sales, it's the AFR, uh, which for midterm rate, 1%. And for Marty, am I still being heard? You're, you're good. You're perfect. Keep going. Okay, um, you, you know we're going to have a, 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 you know about a one percent charge, and if you're doing a grant or a charitable lead trust, it's going to be, or even a charitable uh, uh, remainder trust, it's going to be at the at, at the section seventy five twenty rate, which tomorrow becomes one point two percent. I'm personally forecasting that the rate will actually be lower in May than it is for April, and it may be still lower in June. Uh, these are historically low as a practical matter. Only once in the past has the Section 7520 rate been as, as low as 1%. I think it will be there in May, maybe even lower than that. And you can do grats and you can do, uh, you know, uh, uh, things like uh, charitable lead trusts. And, uh, you, you know, the rate will be very, very low. And, Marty, do you want to say something about long-term versus short-term grants? Yeah, let me just take a, a minute or two and talk about uh, GRATS. Let's skip ahead uh, to that. So keep in mind, you don't want to use GRATS for clients that have not fully exhausted their exemption. It would make much more sense to use an exemption to make a completed gift uh, to a spousal lifetime access trust, a special power of appointment trust, a self-settled trust, or some variation of that um, so the client preserves access and you use the current high temporary exemption because I, I agree with Jonathan. Uh, I, I cannot imagine how we're not, even with the Republican, even with Trump winning uh, the next election, uh, I can't imagine how we're not going to raise taxes to pay for these bailouts. We're, we're, we're not going to have a choice. Um, and certainly it's going to be the wealthiest that are going to bear that tax because the others are not going to be able to. So only use grats once the client has really used up their exemption. Once the client's used up their exemption, Grats with low values and low interest are just uh, a home run. It's just the perfect market, perfect timing to use them. But there are a couple of thoughts to keep in mind when using Grats that may be different than what we've done historically. The traditional Grat plan would be for me to set up a short Grat, say two years, uh, and each year there would be an annuity payment. And when that annuity payment would come, let's say payment in kind, I would take that annuity payment that I got as a set lore and regrat it to a new grat. And then when I got the second annuity payment, I create another grat, now the third one, and regrat that, and so on and so forth. It, it became what were called rolling or cascading grats, where you grat and regrat and regrat. And over time, what happens is a grat will slice off all the appreciation above the 75-20 rate, and all that excess growth is outside the estate for negligible use of exemption. Now, 
Um, the, the Democrat proposals, uh, both the Sanders bill that was actually proposed, I'm not talking just about what they discussed uh, in, 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 in electioneering, but what, what's been proposed, uh, Senator Sanders and Congressman Gomez each proposed um, uh, legislation uh, uh, that would basically emasculate, if not eliminate, the grad technique. So what that would mean if that's enacted by a Democrat or Republican in order to raise taxes, um, we won't be able to grat and regrat. The cascading or rolling grat is gone. So what you might want to do is instead of doing a two-year grat now, you may never get to do another one. The client may be better off if you do a longer-term grat, depending on health, life, longevity, and so on. You may do it a, a series of grats, a six, eight, and 10-year grat, for example. But if you do that, Keep in mind that you have to administer the grat differently. Uh, we don't have time to get into immunization, but that would be different. Mortality risk will have to be addressed. Jonathan, you want to comment on, on granular or uh, acid splitting grats? Yeah, this is instead of putting all the assets in one grat, you have several grats with one grat holding one type of asset. Right after Section 2702 came down, I looked at my portfolio. At that time, I had about a dozen different stocks. I had some Exxon, I had some AT&T, and a few others. And I went back two years and I said, suppose I put all of these in one grat. Well, the market was not very good in the early 2000s, and in fact, that grat failed. I got all the money back as the annuit, nothing passed tax-free. But when I went back and I said, well, suppose I put each stock in a separate grad. Of the dozen that I had, eight turned out to be bad. And again, overall, it was bad. But four were successful, and money would have been transferred to my kids. Now, if you decide to use that strategy, I would strongly recommend you have a different document for each grad. You start each grad on a different day. You have the value of the remainder be slightly different than the others, and you have them run for a slightly different term. Maybe you do two years, then two years in one month, two years in two months, and so on down the line. And I also think it would be beneficial if you actually had different remainder beneficiaries. And you can mix and match a lot of ways. For example, you have a trust just for your oldest child, and then one for the next oldest child, and then for the oldest child with your spouse, and then your oldest child with charity, and you'll easily be able to get a different, a dozen different variations of it. You might say, well, some kids might be benefited from others. Yes, but what you can do in the will of the person creating the grants is to say that your executor can allocate your estate among your descendants in a manner which the executor field, independent executor field, fairly reflects lifetime transfers and what has happened to them prior to your death. So let me very briefly touch upon a 99-year grad. This is really an interest arbitrage, an interest play. If I do a grad now, I don't think I'm going to make it for 99 years. Wish I could, but I'm not optimistic. Um, so what happens if you die during the grad term? Many practitioners' um, initial reaction is, well, if you die before the end of the grad, the grad's included in your estate. And that's not quite correct. In many cases, it will be, but the actual formula is as follows. You take the annuity payment that has to be paid, divide it by the 75-20 rate at the date of death. Not today when you do the grad, but at the date of death. So as Jonathan earlier said, we're getting down to like a 1% 75-20 rate potentially. That is at a historic low. The odds of the rate not being higher when any of us die is pretty good. And if you live 20 years, the odds of interest rates being higher 20 years from now is, is a pretty good bet. If it turns out that there's a 5% 75-20 rate when the client dies, and it was a 1% rate when they did the grat, a huge proportion of the principal will not be brought back into their estate. So when do you use this? And what is unique about this particular point in time? Um, I, as Jonathan, both believe strongly that it's very likely taxes have to be raised to pay for uh, the bailout. And we may have more bailouts coming depending on what happens with the economy. So taxes are going to go up. If a client has done all the planning they can and they're running out of time and they need to move a chunk of assets, this is like a Hail Mary pass, you know, with the last second of the, of the game. Throw out a 99-year grab, put everything you can into it. Client will get back 
you know, a small annuity payment because it's a 99-year grad. They die during the term of the grad. The odds are pretty strong. Interest rates in the future will be higher than they are today, and a large chunk of that wealth will have been moved out of the estate. So this could be a very interesting late planning term. Uh, it, let me well, right, comment Marty, quickly on yes. Marty, let me just say, if you do the grant when the Section 7520 is 1%, as I think it probably will be in May, and if when the client dies, it's 5%, 80% of the original value will escape taxation plus any growth that occurs thereafter. Think of that. 80% is going to pass tax-free. And if it turns out that the client lives for a long time, but the rates get up to 4 or 5 or 6% in the interim, the client can sell off her remaining annuity payments using the same kind of formula and get, you know, 80% of the initial value out plus 100% of the growth. It's an extremely attractive transaction, and it may be one that would appeal to people because they know that they're going to get payments for the rest of their lives. Um, slide 67, um, everybody on the call is familiar with intrafamily loans. It's here to remind us, hey, interest rates are at historic lows. What a great planning tool. Assets are at low values. Give a loan to a kid. Let the kid buy uh, assets, the stock market indices at a low low amount. 20 years from now, it's got to be dramatically higher. Better approach, use a trust, not a child. It's a grant to trust. You can avoid the income tax implication. But, but really, every transaction should be done through trust to protect. You all know that you've got to make sure the clients adhere to the formalities of a loan. Too often they don't. That's the challenge. We don't need to belabor that. Now, here's an interesting planning idea. I have lots of clients, Jonathan, that have done note sale transactions over the years. What should I be talking to all of those clients about? Well, they should consider resetting the rate. And you'll see an article at the bottom of 68 that I wrote with uh, Bridget Crawford and Lisey Madden uh, uh, about 12 years ago, in which we pointed out that you can substitute a new lower AFR note for a previously outstanding AFR note without fear of gift tax and without fear of income tax, provided, number one, the note can be prepaid without penalty. And unless the note says otherwise, throughout the United States, a note can always be prepaid without penalty. And number two, if you're dealing with a grantor trust, there can't be any income tax effect. So, and almost all of these installment sales have been with a grantor trust. This means if your client's uh, on the line to get 3% or 5% or 4% uh, from the trust on the note, you can now reduce it down to the section 7520 rate. And in fact, it might be that you can use a lower term note than you did before, because at least some of the period has now run. And of course, the lower the the shorter the term in general, the lower the section, uh, 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 the lower the AFR is. So that's something to really approach your clients about. Ideal time to make what's going to be includable in your estate lower. Now, if the client says, "But I need the money from the trust," the trust can pay down the note. So if you have, say, a $10 million obligation where you're paying 5%, which would be a half a million a year to the client, you can get it now down to 100000 but give the client still 400000 and that extra 400000 would be pay down a principal, meaning less it's going to be in the estate. So let me tell you just a quick point on this. This is not only just about the great estate tax benefits that Jonathan said. Client sold real estate or a family business to a trust. How is that trust going to pay that interest? Historically, they've been paying it based on distributions from the real estate LLCs or the family business, the widget company. But now with the economy in, in a hard spot, and this may go on or be worse than, than you know a couple of months, uh, and if it does, those family businesses, especially if it's a real estate, a, a, re, a restaurant business, are going to be struggling. This can also lower the cash flow requirements that the business has to distribute. So it's not only going to help from an estate tax perspective, but it may also be valuable um, just to make things work. We, we really have only one minute left. Note sale transactions. Once clients have used up their exemption, note sales are great. Late allocation of GST exemption with values down. Jonathan, you want to just wild them with this off, you know, off-label idea? 
on flight 71. M Marty, you tell him about it. It's your idea, Jonathan. I would never do that. <laughs> no, but you go ahead and tell him about it, Marty. So uh, I may get it backwards, but one of the ways it works. So you can you can do a short sale where you're selling uh, uh, um, Zoom stock that you don't own, and then you buy it back later and fulfill the, the, the order. You can structure a short sale with a grant or trust um, so that you're leveraging the transfer from you to the trust uh, uh, using this kind of transaction. Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me just refine that a little bit. You think the value of one stock is gonna go down and you're, you don't wanna go into the marketplace and take the risk because th there's no limit. But let's say you think that, uh, uh, and I think this is one that probably won't go down. Let's assume you think Amazon is gonna go down. Well, your grantor trust comes to you and says, uh, Marty, I want to sell you $10 million of Amazon stock in a short sale. So the trust doesn't have the stock, but you pay for it. You pay the trust $10 million. What the trust has to do is to not pay you back $10 million, but pay you back the number of shares it sold you. So if that's uh, a 1,000 shares, for example, and if the value of Amazon stock goes down, the grantor trust can go in and buy those shares in the marketplace at the lower value. It was at 100, now it's at 80, it buys it for 80, and it settles up with you by transferring those shares. And because you're with a grantor trust, there's no gain and no loss. And if you have a client who says, I know this stock is gonna go down, but I don't feel comfortable in actually shorting it in the marketplace, you can short it and do some, maybe some significant estate planning in, in the interim. Two last real quick points and then we'll wrap up because we're at the top of the hour. Um, one, valuations of business interest, not just stock equities uh, mark, you know, in the market uh, have to be impacted. You know, the value of a business is based on future cash flows discounted to today. Future cash flows may look more worrisome and hence lower than they did three weeks ago before the, the virus really took hold. Uh, discount rates may be higher because there's certainly more fear, more worry, and more uncertainty in the market. So this may be an opportune time to revalue family business interests and engage in all the different transactions we've talked about. Just keep on your radar screen alternate valuation date. And I'm sorry, I just, for the first time, I saw the typo on the top of slide 75, forgive me. But you know, alternate valuation date, I don't know that I've seen an estate uh, probate with an alternate valuation date in many years. In the, the rece Great Recession, 2008, 9, 10, we had a lot of alternate valuation dates. It may have been the norm, in fact. And I remember writing articles and looking at all sorts of esoteric issues on alternate valuation date. Well, folks, those times are back, and we need to keep this on our radar because the value of, of, of stock of someone who died six months ago uh, and business interest in real estate could all be down dramatically. So keep that on your radar. Uh, there are a few quick comments on income tax payments. Sorry, uh, great time for Roth conversions, and I'm going to skip through the rest. I think we've reached uh, the bottom of the uh, the top of the hour, and we need to wrap up. Uh, very difficult, trying times. We hope, uh, Jonathan and I, that uh, some of the comments we gave you will be practical and useful. We tried to address a, a range of practical issues that we're struggling with in our practices and our lives uh, and uh, a great planning opportunity. So even though it may be a bumpy road, we, we, we're all optimistic that uh, what we all do is going to be very, very important for our clients. Jonathan, any final words? Only thing I can say is that it's really time to help our clients. Uh, they're probably feeling very vulnerable. And we've got to make sure they have those basic estate planning documents that Marty said they always should, but now is the time to really press them to have at least the basics. And again, there are some transactions that they can engage in where they don't lose the full benefit of the property. Thank you all for joining us, and uh, thank you, AAA CPA, for hosting this. Uh, Kimmy, if you're on, I'll turn Absolutely. it back to you. Yes. Yes, thank you so much, Marty. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, and we also thank everybody for attending. Um, on slide 87 that Marty just put on, um, there are their email addresses, Jonathan and Marty. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out directly to them. I'm sure they would be um, more than happy to, to help. And we do hope that everybody is staying safe and healthy. Thank you again for attending. Have a great afternoon.
Bye-bye.